when you're ready. Good afternoon or good morning and welcome to another episode of the Sports Medicine Project. We have a special guest that Blake and I are both, both super, super excited to introduce. We have Rich Willie from Montana Running Lab. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and I certainly appreciate, appreciate this, uh, this opportunity and so it's going to be great to talk the next hour or so about bone health and whatever else comes up. Yes, which I'm sure there will be a lot that comes up, which always happens with these podcasts. But uh, for, for the listeners, uh, Rich, what, what do you do currently and what kind of led you along the pathway to become you know, where you are now? Well, I'm a, uh, my current title is associate professor at uh, the University of Montana. I'm in our school of physical therapy here. And so I teach about about 35, 40% of my time and I do 50% research and then some committee work after that. So um, as far as research, um, I tend to focus on runners uh, and also uh, military relevant questions. So I get some Department of Defense funding here. We study things like um, risk of bone stress injuries, risk of knee injuries, and we look at sex differences also, why mm -hmm. males get certain injuries versus, versus females. So um, clinically, I still treat. Um, I treat maybe one to four hours a week, um, which is really nice. And it's something that is very fulfilling for me. And I think if I didn't continue doing that, I think I would lose probably a little bit of focus on my teaching as well as research. So um, I've been a PT since 1999. Um, I came out and I first started off actually doing more occupational health. So I started off working in, in, in factories and, and so <laughs> forth. So which is actually a really nice way to kind of get started. It wasn't that I that I wanted to do that. It's just that there weren't that many PT jobs available at the time that were in sports medicine. So I started off doing that. Um, and, you know, I actually, you know, I actually kind of really grew to like it a lot. Um, I think there are a lot of really nice parallels between runners and people who have occupational health injuries. So in other words, like someone who's a steel worker, they don't say that they go and work at a steel plant. It's kind of like runners. Runners don't say that they, they're someone who runs, typically call themselves a runner. So if someone mm -hmm. who's working at a steel factory gets hurt, you know, they, they end up losing part of their, their sense of self, which is very much the same as runners when they can't run. And so um, for me, I, you know, I kind of gradually started working more toward in sports medicine type setting. And so I did that for several years. And then after eight years as a PT, went back and got my PhD in biomechanics and movement sciences from the University of Delaware. And so I, I started that in 2007 and I finished in 2011. And so I've been a faculty member kind of ever since doing research and kind of doing the same thing that I'm doing now. So um, yeah, it's good. So I've been a PT now for, I guess, 23 years, which is a little bit hard to believe, but wow. it's been, it's, been it's, gone, it's, gone, you know, it's gone, it's gone kind of quick, but um, it's been a wonderful <laughs> career and I really couldn't, really couldn't ask for anything else. I think there isn't really a part of my job that I don't really, you know, that is not something, you know, all that, all those parts of my job, I very much look forward to every day. So it's, it's a, it's a really great job. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, you've been busy <laughs> the last several years by the sounds of it. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah. I was for, for a couple of years, I was our department chair. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and that was, that was a little bit more into the management side of, from what, I probably see myself doing the rest of my career, but it was a nice, nice opportunity to see that side of academia. Um, I had to drop back on some research stuff. So I'm really looking forward to kind of, kind of getting back up to, to the level that I like doing as far as from a productivity standpoint, but yeah, I appreciate that. It's really, it's been, it's, you know, it's great I, for me. I think it's, it's awesome. I get paid to think and get paid to, you know, ask questions that I think are, are, are certainly cool and get to write papers on it. So it's a, it's a really, it's a really great career. Yeah, I've got to admit, and thank you so much for like your Instagram page and your research as well. But I think for most of the listeners, especially younger practitioners who follow um, Montana Running Lab on Instagram, some of the content and, and the synthesis of the research you put out is it's just, it really is incredible and so, so interesting to see. And it really, it has translation to my clinical practice and I'm sure Kelly's as well. Oh, cool. So yeah, I've got to say thank you for that, definitely. Oh yeah, thanks. No, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, we do it basically because, well, you know, Instagram is is a funny place. I mean, you can, <laughs> anybody could put anything up, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I'm guessing that, you know, you're running into the same thing that, that we were running into, which is that a lot of, you know, a lot of runners and also clinicians were, you know, getting a lot of information from Instagram. And it seemed like there was a bit of a void there as far as like uh, evidence-based uh, recommendations and synthesis of multiple papers. Um, and that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to make it 
somewhat digestible, something that is not overly complex as far mm -hmm. as like multiple multiple pages on Instagram. So yeah, thanks for that. I really appreciate it. it sounds like it's hitting its mark and yeah. it is, it is a lot of fun to do it. So really, I really enjoyed it. It's, it's not something that obviously Instagram is not something unless you've got like 2 million followers, you're going to make any money off of doing it. So yeah. it's more, more of a fun thing um, to do than anything. Yeah. yeah sure. And we'll, um, we'll, we'll get stuck in. Yeah. So first question off the bat, I guess we better <laughs> sort of start, start at the beginning. So the pathophysiology of bone stress injuries, um, can we, can we, briefly sort of touch on on that for the listeners yeah definitely well you know we don't we don't really understand how bone stress injuries occur we have a pretty good idea uh, I think that a lot of researchers who are much more basic than I am, uh, meaning they use animal models often and we do a lot of imaging uh, are trying to figure this out <laughs> but excuse me uh, but you know essentially what we're looking at we're looking at a mismatch and the rate that new bone is being laid down uh, relative to the amount that bone is being broken down. And so it's an accumulation of bone micro damage. And what happens is that we'll have, you know, we'll start doing a lot of loading and bone is naturally turning over on all of us. When you start loading a lot, um, bone micro damage starts to accumulate at a more rapid rate. Um, and then what happens after a period of time, we have these bone cells that are called osteoclasts that will kind of work their way in and start removing some of this bone micro damage. There's a lag between when those bone cells come in and when, when osteoblasts arrive, which are the bone cells that are going to lay down new bone. And so in that, that time period, there ends up being about a three to four week period where things seem like they're going pretty good, but then bone micro damage starts to accumulate. And it's not really until that fourth, fourth week when um, the osteoblasts start laying down new bone. And so usually around the third to fourth week is when bone is at its weakest. And that's when, when most um, <coughs> excuse me, bone stress injuries um, start to occur. Excuse me. You're right. Mm. Mm. Sorry about that, excuse me. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so that's kind of when, when bone stress surgery starts to occur, it starts to sh sh first show up as some accumulation of, of bone marrow edema. It might start getting some cortical bone disruption. Um, it's not until we start seeing cortical bone disruption that that's uh, apparent on a radiograph. So uh, MRI will start to show bone marrow edema a little bit earlier. And that's one of the reasons why MRI is a better imaging tool for most, most bone stress injuries. So um, yeah, bone stress injuries, I think that's one of the things that I think people tend to make the mistake about is when it comes to equating the workload that they're doing in a given week with like how they're doing. It's not really until you're three, four weeks down the road that you can really tell how someone has done with an amount of the amount of workload that they've been doing. And so like after the holidays, which are you know upon us, a lot of people will embark on on fitness programs and so forth. And bone stress injuries will really start showing up around the first week of February or so. Yeah. Yeah, that makes there, sense. Oh, sorry. Um, is there any way to to identify any sort of changes in that sort of three week period? So like when there is that lag, is there, is there anything that people could potentially be looking out for, do you think? Ooh, that's a, well, that, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think that would be the million dollar <laughs> research question is if you can stop a bone stress injury while it's in its early stages. Mm -hmm. You know, clinically, there doesn't really seem to be anything. And there's been some work looking at some different uh, like bone biomarkers um, that the military is looking at so they can, you know, track how people are responding to loads. But um, there really isn't a really good tool for this. Um, the best predictor, of course, is if you've had a bone stress injury in the past. And so if you've had a prior bone stress injury, you have a 600% increased risk, risk of having a subsequent one. Wow. So, um, and, and that's for, that's for females, males, it's actually a little bit higher. It's a 700% increased risk. Mm -hmm. So if that sounds like you, um, you know, when you do some sort of training load error, the injury that you're going to get is probably going to be another bone stress injury and it might be at a different site. So if you've had a tibial bone stress injury in the past, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're going to get a bone stress injury there again. It might be somewhere else in your fibula or, or metatarsal okay. or what have you. Um, but yeah, so I think that that's probably the number one predictor. Um, we know that there are some other things that contribute to risk as well that I think are really important to watch out for. Some of those might be, um, loss of sleep. So we know that athletes who are not getting at least six and a half hours of sleep or so um, have a, about a 20 to 30% increased risk of developing a bone stress injury during a large training spike. 
Um, and uh, the other ones that I think would be important risk factors would be, you know, if the athlete had like didn't play ball sports uh, when they were growing mm -hmm. up, particularly between the ages of, of nine and 13, that seems to be a really kind of crucial time for building um, bone diameter, uh, which is a real strong predictor of, of, of bone strength later on in life. Um, if that sounds like you, um, that also, um, if, you, you know, if you've done that, that's great. It's really hard to go back in time and change some of these bone, uh, these, these bone stress injury risk factors. So I think those would be some important ones. Um, and of course, if, you know, for females, if there was um, delayed menarche or any sort of menstrual disruption as a teenager, even though you might be in your 20s or even 30s, um, you know, that's a really crucial time for having optimal uh, hormonal health. And, um, you know, because when it, when it comes to lying or laying down new bone. And so if that sounds like you when you're in your teens, um, that's unfortunately going to increase your risk of developing a bone stress injury later on in life as well. Wow. As far as, as far as like looking at early, early indicators, you know, I don't know, I would have to say that, um, you know, bone injuries, you know, bone, you know, this, this accumulation of bone damage kind of lags behind, um, other injuries. So if you've been experiencing a lot of muscle soreness, because muscle is going to be a little bit more responsive to loading. Um, I think, I think that would be someone that I would probably pay very close attention to. So if you're experiencing a lot of uh, delayed onset muscle soreness in the first couple of weeks, uh, I think that that's telling you that your muscular system is having a hard time keeping up with the amount of load that you're throwing at it. And, you know, muscles attached to bone. If the muscle is having a hard time, then I'm sure the bone is having a hard time too. Mm, that's a good one. I like that. Have yeah. we, we moved away and I remember learning this at a university level from like what we think are likely contributors, the like the muscle traction theory of the deep plantar flexors, and then also the bending forces on the tibia and the impact forces. Can you speak much to to those kind of theories and, and if the way have kind of moved away from them? Yeah, I mean every every bone stress injury is different, or each bone stress injury site is a little bit different. And like, what are the contributing factors um, to those? I mean, you know, about about forty to fifty percent of all bone stress injuries involve the posterior medial tibia. And so we know the most of that about that injury. And so it used to be thought that impact forces were a really large part of this. And this kind of really, really got very popularized by the book Born to Run mm -hmm. and that and the whole barefoot running craze. Um, everybody was very concerned about impact forces. And, um, you know, at the time it kind of made some sense. Um, but now that we're starting to understand like how to model bone forces a little bit better, it seems that the muscle forces are the biggest contributors to overall bone loads. And so when you think about a bone, um, you know, there's an anterior portion of it and a posterior portion to it. And when you think about your tibia, your plantar flexors are very strong. And when they contract, they will bow that, that, that tibia posteriorly. And then we'll get a lot of traction force on the anterior aspect of your, of, of your, of your tibial shaft. You get um, strain there. You also get um, stress, which is basically the amount of force on a given surface area. Um, that's also going to occur in the posterior aspect as well. And so we tend to get more bone stress injuries in the posterior aspect, but the ones that are on the anterior aspect of our tibia are the ones that are much more serious. Those mm -hmm. are the more of the, um, these high risk bone stress injuries that are going to take a really long time to heal. So, yeah, so I think that we used to think that um, it was this muscle traction that also contributed. But it's really not so much that it's more like the muscle is twisting and bending the bone. And that's what's and that's what's uh, causing a lot of stress uh, on, you know, throughout the bone. Um, and so, you know, with that being said, when we're looking at like, how can we control bone stress, it used to be that it was impacts, but now it's much more so looking at like muscle forces. And a good rule of thumb, for instance, in the lower leg is that anything that increases your plantar flexor forces, so soleus or mm, gastrocnemius yeah. forces, increases tibial bone stress. And not only does it increase tibial bone stress, it also will increase metatarsal bone stress as well, too. So for instance, like if you run in a low drop shoe, we know that that increases your demands in your plantar flexors, and that's also going to increase tibial bone stress, but it'll also increase the bending torques on your, um, your metatarsals, for instance. And so another way to look at that too, is if you want to reduce your bone stress, you just control the amount of plantar flexor forces that you're experiencing in your lower legs, and that's going to reduce your overall, your overall bone loads. Yeah. Is that, and talking to that, how, and I, I mean, I had two 
two uh, medial tibial stress syndrome patients this morning and three yesterday and explaining to them, you know, how do we build bone resiliency? Like what, what ways and metrics and clinicians and athletes think about, like my understanding is it's heavy resistance and plyometrics and just getting the dosage right. What, what do you have to say about that? Yeah. I mean, we know that, you know, bone, I mean, load is not good or bad, you know, and there's, so the load can be very helpful. The load can be very helpful. It can also cause injury and like too much of it causes injury, but the right amount will make something stronger. And so bones, the same, you know, bone, you know, behaves according to that law. And so when you look at it, if you're, if you're trying to increase bone health, um, the best thing to do is, you know, 20 to 40 repetitions of, of a very high magnitude load. And that load should exceed what you typically will experience during your activity of choice. So if you're a runner, the load that you're experiencing on your tibia should exceed that load that you would normally be experiencing during running. So when we run, our tibial bone force ends up being around nine body, uh, body weights of force, which sounds like a lot. And when you think about it, you know, going back to the prior question, about two and a half times our, our body weight are, is, is the vertical ground reaction force. And, and the rest of that, the remainder of that, the remainder of six and a half body weights is coming from your soleus and your plantar flexors. So if you wanna make your tibia stronger, the way to do that is to do some some sort of heavy resistance training yes, that's going to be loading to your your <laughs> your plantar flexors and you want to make sure that that loading is not just heavy but also fast as well mm. because that's what's going to cause a lot of strain in the bone and the bone strain is what kind of excites these osteoblasts that are going to lay down a new bone um plyometrics are even better um, because you can load the bone so much faster and you can also get a lot higher forces on the bone as well particularly if you're you know, if you're doing like even just a very, um, I guess, modest um, like drop jump from like a 30 centimeter box or something like that, when you do that, you know, you're going to hit the ground, you're going to hit the ground with maybe three, three and a half times your body weight, uh, your tibial bone forces are going to be up in the double digits, and you're going to be causing a lot of bending and twisting to the bone, and that's going to, you know, result in some sort of bone stimulus, and the bone's going to react and get stronger. It'll take some time for that to happen. But um, that's, really, that's really the way to do it. What happens is that if you keep loading with a lot of repetitions, that's when the bone stops responding. The bone micro damage continues and that's how you're gonna get a bone stress injury. So, if you, so there's really this kind of this very delicate dance that you wanna have where you're, you're jumping some and you're jumping with a lot of forces or you're lifting with a lot of forces and you're maybe only doing 40, maybe 50 repetitions at most. Then you take a break, you don't load for four to five hours, and then maybe you go mm. and do it again. Yeah. Take another break, four to five hours, and do it again. And that would be the, the best, most optimal loading program that you can put yourself on. Most people can't do that. And so the other way to do it is just space it out over a couple of days, and you're still going to get some really nice changes in overall bone health. That's great. I'm going to call those patients now and say, hey, you're doing the right thing. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, so when we're on the topic of, you know, locations of, of bone stress injuries and, and sex differences as well, which we touched on previously, I, I saw a post recently that, that you put up uh, about the, the differences in, in location between males and females of bone stress injuries being uh, trabecular bone, um, perhaps more common in females and cortical bone perhaps being more common in males due to the effects of red S. Can we, can we talk about that? Because this is something that I've been really thinking about quite a lot lately and I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear your thoughts on it in, in length. Yeah, so the tibia, whether you're male or female, is the most common site for uh, for bone stress injuries, followed by metatarsals. And so when you look at males, about 55% of all bone stress injuries are in the posterior medial tibia. For females, it ends up being around 35%. A quarter of all bone stress injuries are in the metatarsals, which with uh, the second metatarsal being the most commonly affected. Um, once you get once you get away from that then things become a little bit more distributive in females. So females tend to have more, more femoral bone stress injuries. They tend to get much like many more um, sacral bone stress injuries, perhaps pelvic and also lumbar bone stress injuries. We don't see that as much in, in, uh, in males. And there are a couple of different reasons for that. But the big one being that 
The lumbar spine, the sacrum is a much more of a trabecular rich site. So you have much more trabecular bone. Trabecular bone is much more metabolically active. So it requires a lot more energy. And so because of that, it is more susceptible to red S. Red S is much more common in female athletes than males. At least that's what we think. Um, and uh, it's not that males don't get it, but females are a little bit more prone to that. So a good rule of thumb is the closer you're to the ground, the more biomechanics matter. The further you get away from the ground, the more that uh, energy availability matters. So if you're treating someone with like a, with a femoral bone stress injury, particularly femoral neck, um, used to be, we used to think, okay, well, surely there's some biomechanics that are uh, at play here. And there are some, for instance, in the military for people who are shorter, um, who have smaller bones, which are, who are often female, just happen to be, but they end up having to take a longer stride um, to keep stride with taller cadets, for instance, and that can result in a lot of extra bending forces on the femoral neck. But the femoral neck also has a lot of trabecular bone in it. And so um, with the exception of that one, like overstriding type, type biomechanic, if you see someone with a femoral neck bone stress injury, you should immediately start thinking, relative energy deficiency in sport um, and sacrum, absolutely. I think if you have someone with a sacral bone stress injury, I think probably one of the last things you should probably be talking to them about is their, their biomechanics and yeah. lumbar spine even, <laughs> even, even more so. So if you, if you see someone and they go off and they get, um, and I've seen, I've heard patients, patients have come back, they've come to see me for like consults after they've seen other people, they'll bring in like the, like a, Kind of like a DEXA scan, they're like they're like oh you know I'm I'm only I'm only only osteopenic, and my and my lumbar spine and my femoral neck it looks okay and when you look at the numbers that's true, but because the lumbar spine has so much more trabecular bone than the femoral neck does for instance, we start seeing the effects of red ass and these trabecular rich bone sites. So the you know, lumbar spine has much more trabecular bone than the femoral neck does, much and that has much more. Uh, trabecular bone than like the metatarsal shaft does. And so when you get down to the metatarsals, it's much more of a cortical bone type structure. Uh, there's not a lot of trabecular bone there. And cortical bone is not quite as susceptible to these like fluctuations and and energy availability. Um, and so we can typically get away with some periods of low energy availability with those bone sites, um, but you're not going to be able to get, get away with that with sites that are more proximal. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've, I've often wondered, you know, um, patients with sacral stress fractures, you know, how, how does it, you know, you're loading your legs and there's such a, a large amount of force going through mm. the, the lower leg. How does the sacrum end up with a, a stress fracture? So that makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, I, I was quite uh, curious as to by what mechanism that was, but you explained that really well as the tra trabecular bone being more, you know, energy hungry. And if you're not fueling appropriately, then, then that's certainly going to put you at risk of um, an injury in that area. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, something else to think about too, is that, you know, our, our, our pelvis forms a ring. And, you know, like we wear a wedding ring for a reason because it's supposed to like, you know, symbolize something that's, that's very strong, right? And they are, rings are very strong. Like our, our diaphysis on our bones are, there are rings or it's a cylinder. So it's a very strong, but the way that that works is that when you load one part of that ring of that, of that pelvic ring, it's going to distribute the load the whole way throughout the ring. And so if you're talking about your sacrum, the, uh, the overall bone loads are not as much, but when you run, like the sacrum is getting loads with both foot strikes. And so the, so it, it doesn't take a lot of load up there when someone is not repairing micro damage very well for them to start accumulating this micro damage and end up getting this, 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 uh, this bone stress injury. And unfortunately they get missed for a long period of time. These, these more trabecular rich bone stress injuries, femoral neck BSIs, they get missed on average for five months. Um, wow. and that's five months of lost healing time. Um, sacrum, same time, same, same deal. They often, um, you know, PTs, they, when they see someone coming in with pain in that area, they often start thinking, uh, like an SI joint issue. And so it's, it's happened multiple times in my career. I've seen someone who's been treated for SI joint dysfunction, but they actually have a, like a, some sort of sacral bone stress injury that just has not been picked up yet. Yeah. Wow. Is it, is it true bone health? And I think I heard this on, on Brad Beer's podcast, I think with Stuart Warden, is, is it true that up to 75% of, of bone health is determined by someone's genetics? Like, is there a big genetic predisposition? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have, 
Well, you know, it's and, and genetic predisposition determines like your bone size. So uh, some really early work from the late 90s from Kim Bunnell, uh, they were looking at, um, at calf girth and also malleolar width. And of course, that's going to give you some idea of overall like bone size. Mm. And so, you know, the larger, if you have two people that have bones that are of are, are equal size, or I'm sorry, of, of equal load or, or accepting equal loads, the person with the smaller bone, that bone is always going to break down first. Mm. So your genetics is what determines that. So, yeah, I mean, genetics is really like when we're talking about, you know, weight training, we're talking about sleep, we're talking about plyometrics. These are just things that are going to cause very, very small changes in overall bone health. Your genetics is what's going to really determine this. And, and of course, also what you were doing as a teenager and, and preteens. But after that, our ability to move that needle is, is certainly there, but it's not, it's not like this major thing that we're able to really affect, but we still can do it. And it's certainly, certainly well worth our time to do that as clinicians. Yeah. Can you talk much to, to many of the other factors that contribute or I guess other things that athletes and clinicians, depending on where, what kind of profession you're in as a clinician, can recommend to athletes and people, you know, for example, you know, there's a bit of research around vitamin D and supplements and, and medications and obviously nutrition. Is there anything that, that you've seen that, that works incredibly well or that you recommend that clinicians can probably think about recommending with their patients? Yeah, I mean, I think I think vitamin D is a really interesting one. There seems to be some relationship between vitamin D and certain bone stress injuries. So anterior cortex bone stress injuries seem to be a little bit more susceptible to vitamin D deficiencies. Um, so there's that. Um, I think that, you know, I'm not a registered dietitian. I think mm -hmm. that um, I think anybody who um, you know, I, I think a lot of runners running is a very energy intensive sport. And I think that if you have any sort of um, uh, dietary restriction, and that is whether it be, you know, voluntary or involuntary. So if you're lactose intolerant, for instance, or you don't, you don't eat gluten, um, or whatever, you, you know, you name it. Those are individuals, if you're running, it's a very energy intensive activity and you really should probably get a, a consult from a registered dietitian just to check in and make sure that you're hitting all your macro and your micronutrients and your, your overall caloric demand of the activity. Um, and of course, gluten mimics a lot of sense, right? Because I mean, gluten is in a lot of carbohydrates. And so if you're you know, really picky about your carbohydrate consumption because of gluten, you're, you're gonna be much more prone to developing some sort of energy deficit. Um, the other ones too, I think, um, I think anybody who's on any sort of like, you know, quote unquote diet. So like right now, like we hear a lot about paleo diets. Um, you know, there's been some, some really nice work that has shown that even brief periods of, uh, doing a, a, a high fat, low carb diet results in a, in a rapid accumulation of bone micro damage. We see a lot of a big spike in bone biomarkers that is telling us that there's a lot of of bone breakdown that's occurring and our um, the other biomarker that is signaling that that new bone is being laid down doesn't seem to go up at the same rate as if someone is supplementing with carbohydrates so i think like so i think that's that's a really important one i think it, and i think it's when i first came out with my phd in 2011 i came out of this biomechanics lab we were doing a lot of work with biomechanics looking at tibial bone stress injuries and so for me i thought biomechanics was the main driving factor here but more and more i think it really has to do with energy availability mm. that really matters the most um and so i think and i can't i can't emphasize that enough i think like it's something that you know clinicians have a they're maybe a little bit uncomfortable talking to someone about. Um, and I think it's really important to make sure that you can kind of pick up on, on the signs and symptoms of someone who has, who has experienced some, some energy deficiencies. And it used to be that we would use BMI as the screening tool. And which, I mean, I mean, of course, that, I mean, that makes some sense. And so someone who had a, had a, had a BMI um, a below 19, you know, but I mean, that is, that is very lean. That is a very lean individual. Um, and let's go to the, to the other, you know, to the, um, our pathological kind of, our, our, our clinical entity of this, someone who has a, uh, a true eating disorder, um, only about 7% of those individuals who have an eating disorder have, um, have, have, have a low BMI, have a BMI below 20. 
Um, so using BMI as a screening tool and saying, oh, that person's body mass is just fine. Uh, and they don't have energy deficiency issues is, is not a very, mm -hmm. it's a very blunt instrument and it doesn't work very well. And you're going to miss the vast majority of people that are having some sort of energy deficiency issues. We know that if you um, exercise for 12 hours or more per week, it's really darn hard to hit your, the overall caloric demands of the activity. And so PTs and podiatrists should be very comfortable asking questions with, of patients. Mm -hmm to make sure that you know say hey like talk to me about how much you're exercising per week and is it if it's if you're hearing 12 hours per week or more um if they've had a previous bone stress injury um so if they've had more than two low risk bone stress injuries or they've had one high risk bone stress injury so if you've had a navicular bone stress injury or second metatarsal or anterior cortex tibial bone stress injury or so forth those should be, you should have like your spidey sense should start going off. Hey, this is someone that we probably need to pay a little bit extra attention to. Um, other patients, of course, if there's any sort of menstrual disruption, um, that's your kind of your canary in the coal mine, um, that this person's physiology is not adequate to support their overall uh, endocrine health. And of course, that's what's driving our bone adaptation. So I think those things are, are all are all really important. I think I'm going I'm going a little bit from memory, but um, oh, the other ones. I think there are some other ones too. Is you know, I, I for me, I talked a lot to patients about about gastric distress. Uh, I think this is a really important, mm. really really I've often missed before. one. Yeah, yeah, big one. About that. Yeah, the big one. I asked them like, do you ever have any gastric issues when you run or exercise? And there are two different reasons for that. One is that if someone has some um, gastric distress. They often might get a little bit fearful about that, and then they won't fuel adequately before the run, or they might not be able to fuel adequately after. So there's there's that there's that direct mm -hmm. effect. But the other thing too is that our digestive system is very energy intensive as well. It takes a lot of energy to digest food, and so if you're if you're not consuming enough calories to to fuel your exercise or what have you, you're also not going to have enough calories coming in to fuel like your your digestive system. And so your gastric, your gastric motility will go down. Um, you'll start having a lot of um, GI distress, uh, you know, and so forth. So those are those are all like really important signs that I think a lot of times we as runners, we call them like, you know, I don't know, like you know, runners like boo boo belly or whatever, but <laughs> I think those those things are really are really important um, for us to be paying uh, close attention to. So, um, in, and anyway, so there are those. Um, we kind of got off on on energy deficiency stuff, but I, I think that you know, again, I think that those things are 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 are, are really important. I think anybody who um, you know, go we'll take a step back and go back to mechanical loading, because of course you're not going to get a bone stress injury unless there's some mechanical loading that's being applied to the skeletal system. So um, we know that certain types of loads are going to be a little bit more hazardous for a bone. Um, you know, a lot of times we kind of think of like of the high mileage runner as being someone who might be at greater risk. And, and that actually has more to do with the fact that they're burning a lot of calories. So we've got, we basically have two different Two different ends of the spectrum. We have the high volume runner who is going to be burning a lot of energy, and they're going to have that's going to be much more perhaps of a red S kind of issue. And then on the other end, if you start doing a lot of like high magnitude type loads, so sprinting, for instance, um, sprint jumping for like the jumping athlete, for so basketball players and, and volleyball players mm, and so forth. Yeah. Um, running uphill, we used to think that running uphill is actually going to be very low loads on a bone. But because when you run uphill, your your calf forces, your plantar flexor forces go up quite a bit. That's going to really increase your bone strain. So those those types of of of, of loads, we know that um, for every ten percent increase in bone magnitude or um, sorry magnitude of loading. So every for every ten percent of magnitude of loading increase, we see a fifty percent reduction in the number of loading cycles before we start getting failure of the cortical bone. So that's really important. There's a so it's an exponential relationship between speed work and bone micro damage accumulation. And the reason why it's really important is because we need to make sure that we're being very, very careful when we're prescribing our training loads, that we're also not also increasing the overall volume of training that they're doing as well. So once you start introducing speed work into an athlete's program, you need to draw down their overall running volume. And when you, when you look at most like I don't know, half marathon programs or marathon programs, they're doing those things simultaneously. They're increasing volume at the same time that they're also increasing the amount of speed work. And it's not surprising that a lot of people get bone stress injuries leading up to a big marathon. 
Yeah, and they happen. It's like the elite athletes as well. It's not just the recreational runners. It's some of the best athletes in the world are pulling out with injuries and bone stress injuries, and it still still amazes me that it can still happen at that level. Yeah, right. Well, in fact, the, for uh, elite athletes, the main injuries they're going to get are going to be tendinopathies and bone stress injuries. They rarely get knee injuries. It's not an injury that they get. Um, you you tend to see a lot of foot and ankle bone stress injuries in that group, and you know you see a lot of foot and ankle tendinopathies as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that you, so you have an athlete, and that, those cases they are running a lot of volume. Their year round running is very high as well, and we can talk about that in a second as well. Why that's a a thought to be a risk factor. Um, and then you start throwing on these like, you know, very high volume uh, workout or interval workouts where they're running very fast. And so they're, they're, they're running very, very fast. And so the loads on the bone are very high. And so that magnitude increases. And so their rate of a risk of accumulating micro damage um, goes up considerably. Um, the flip side is also very true. And I think it's really important to think about these things. Again, it's going back to load, it's not good or bad. But if you increase load by or loading magnitude by 10%, you reduce the number of loading cycles in half that they can, uh, the, uh, the actual bone can, can, um, can tolerate. But if you reduce loading magnitude by 10%, you increase the number of loading cycles that, that bone can tolerate mm. by 50%. So it goes both ways. And that's why like even small reductions in loading magnitude per step go a really long way to reducing one's risk of developing a bone stress injury. So for instance, on your easy runs, run easy. Don't run, like, and run, what I mean by that is run slow because that loading is gonna be very low per step and it's gonna reduce your risk of accumulating micro damage. Um, other things you can uh, do too, I think this is where shoe wear is really, or foot or, or shoes are really important. Um, I think that, you know, running in the, in the right type of shoe, I think is important. I think like, a running in a racing flat or a minimalist shoe all the time, I think is probably is not a good idea um, because the overall plantar flexor forces end up end up being quite high. So I think like rotating your shoes and into a shoe that um, is, is going to be maybe a higher drop shoe makes a lot of sense because that's going to reduce your metatarsal and your tibial bone uh, bending forces as well. Nice. So I'll, when people ask why I'm running so slow on my Strava, I can just say, I'm just reducing my risk of a bone stress injury. Don't touch me. That's right. So talk us through a typical, um, the typical journey of, of someone with a bone stress injury that might walk into your clinic. Let's say yeah. they've got a... Uh, tibial, tibial. That's the most common one. Tibial. We better go tibia. It's most common, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can, I can, I can talk about about those. Um, so look, yeah, we'll say it's a posterior medial uh, tibial bone stress injury. We know that um, ninety percent of those occur in the in the middle or the distal portion of your of your tibia. So we only get a few in the in the proximal portion of your tibia. Um, once you get down there, when you start looking at diagnosing someone, you know, you, you know, one of the best things you could do is a hop test. And so have them hop 10 times so you can see if you can reproduce the pain. Um, we know that, and then immediately you jump in there and you see, you try to figure out like that, that zone of bone tenderness. And if that, that, if that zone is more than, more than five centimeters, you can start feeling pretty comfortable that this is going to be medial tibial stress syndrome, which is a different entity than an actual tibial bone stress injury. Once it starts getting below 5%, then you really need to start considering a tibial bone stress injury. Um, and so then at that point, depends on the patient population. Um, if you're gonna send that person off to imaging, I think the default in the United States is to get imaging. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily uh, needed for everyone. Um, I think that if you have a very, very focal bone tenderness um, and it's in that distal, you know, prox or distal, put the posterior medial tibia. I think you can probably feel pretty comfortable that it's some uh, some degree of a, of a tibial bone stress injury. If it's on the anterior cortex where they've got their tenderness, you, you really need to send them off for imaging because that's a high risk area. And those get missed for a very long time too. Those get missed on average of five and a half months. Um, but I think I think from there, the the imaging thing. I think where a lot of clinicians will go wrong, and I know we're just talking about the initial screening part of it is that um, they might do something like use a tuning fork. Uh, I don't know if that's very <laughs> prevalent in, the, in Australia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something that you see a lot in, uh, in, in some medical settings here in the United States where they don't have access to imaging. And I'm thinking about like some sideline, like mm -hmm. athletic training will do this a lot or some physical therapists that are working on the sidelines of certain sports, like in the in athletic training room. 
Uh, they'll, they may they may use like a like a tuning fork where they basically hit a tuning fork on on a hard surface and then they put the the uh, tuning fork on the bone to see if it reproduces the pain. Um, the other way that you'll see some people do this will be to use an, uh, a diagnostic or not diagnostic but a therapeutic ultrasound unit and run it over the bone and see if that elicits pain. Um, and with the idea being that if it elicits pain, that that's going to be an indication that that's going to be a bone stress injury. That's been done in the United States for a really long time. However, the accuracy of that is terrible. Mm -hmm. You're more accurate if you flip a coin. Um, and so what we see a lot of times uh, happening is that people have all the signs and symptoms of a tibial bone stress injury. Um, someone will do like this tuning fork test on them. It won't elicit pain and they'll be like, oh, you don't have a bone stress injury. You can keep running. And then this just ends up being this injury that just keeps on dragging it out and self out and, be, and maybe perhaps even becoming more severe and then takes a longer time to, for that athlete to recover. Um, so anyway, so those are MRIs, the gold standard for diagnosing these injuries, as you know. And so, um, if that's what you're going to do, that's, that's great. Radiograph is often done. Um, but that, as I mentioned earlier, that's going to miss a lot of the early stage, um, bone stress injuries. Um, I wanted to, so, sorry to, to butt in there and ask around the, like when they are hopping, if they have some, some discomfort and I'm, I'm sure the severity of pain would determine probably will be likely to determine how severe the injury is. If they do have a little bit of discomfort and you can reproduce some diffuse pain, it, it's kind of on the verge. You know, you imagine it is kind of a stress reaction or some bony edema. When do you say, you know, no running for six weeks or what's your kind of black and white there based off your mm -hmm. clinical assessment, which is always hard, I know. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's medial tibial stress syndrome, that's something you can you can continue running with, mm -hmm. you know. And so if that footprint of that bony palpation that's very tender is five centimeters. There's a really nice study out of Israel that was published um, two years ago with, a, with their um, with their military. And they found that if you have tenderness that exceeds 10 centimeters and 10 centimeters is just the width of, of four fingers, you can, you can, you can, with hundred percent confidence, you, you know, that that is not a, not a tibial bone stress injury. That's going to be metatars or medial tibial stress syndrome. Yeah. Um, for me, if I think it's less than that, I suspect a bone stress injury. I mean, I, I don't have that person continue running. Yeah. I think that that's a, that's a no, that's a non-starter for me. I think that they need to take some time off, um, and they can do some cross training and we can do some management there, but, um, and, and we really want to catch it early because if not, if they continue running on it, the likelihood that this is going to uh, progress into a more severe bone stress injury, which is going to require a longer recovery period. Uh, there, there's would no you, reason why that why that wouldn't happen. Would you say the same about MTSS that that could potentially progress to bone stress injuries or not? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that's a great question, and I think there's a lot of debate. Um, you know, it seems like it's kind of dying down a little bit, but it, it, for a while there, are a lot were kind of pushing this idea that MTSS kind of fell under the bone stress injury was it was like a precursor to a an actual bone stress injury um i you know i would say that most would say that that's probably not the case they they seem to be different clinical entities that's not saying that um you know people who develop medial tibial st stress syndrome don't also have some um impaired bone architecture um and so there are some studies that have shown that medial tibial stress syndrome is a the prior mtss does seem to be a risk factor for developing a tibial bone stress injury but i would say that it's the fact that it's on this continuum i i don't know i don't know if i see that i mean i, I see a lot of i mean you look at most high school runners are going to develop mtss and for those athletes um you know i work on trying to you know try to control their their biomechanical loads um, you know, for me, I tend to put them into like a high drop shoe, um, yeah. reduce their, uh, reduce their volume, uh, uh, in particular, some of their volume of like speed work. And usually, you know, I, I don't know when I look at that population, I think of, of, uh, again, this is a high school athlete holding them out of athletic participation. I think the risks are much greater there than continuing to run with MTSS. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. How, how do you, how do you all approach that? <laughs> yeah, pr pretty, pretty similar. Like uh -huh. I, I wanted to, I'll cut you off, Kelly, because I just want to get this question in. Because it was one I've been dying to ask. When when you have you know diagnosed someone with MTSS and you've reduced their training load, and then you're getting them stuck into the rehab to to build that bone resiliency, how acceptable is pain during the rehab? And I'm thinking similar to tendons, where you know there are some studies to say less than a three out of ten is acceptable. How does that with bones? When you're doing plyometrics and heavy calf raises, is a little bit of pain acceptable and, and considered normal? 
Yeah, for MTSS, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what we do. I just I yeah. think of it. I use that pain monitoring model Good. Uh, Good. for for uh, for MTSS. Which which by the way, and and I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but that that pain monitoring model that you're referring to that Karn Silbernagel published in back in 2007. Mm. It actually got started in patella femoral pain in 1997. Oh, so she, right. so her, one of her PhD supervisors, Roland Tomé, uh, used it for rehabbing patella femoral pain. So it's been around for other diagnoses. So I, it, with yeah. that being said, I feel like he can feel comfortable using it for other, other yeah. diagnoses for sure. And then as well, like if you have diagnosed more severe, you know, MTSS or stress fracture or tibial injury, what's your general protocol of offloading. I know here in Oz, it's a little bit of a difference, but it's generally six to eight weeks um, in a boot. And if it's more severe, it's complete non-weight bearing or then if it's less severe, more non, uh, just weight bearing in a, a cam walker or a moon boot. Yeah. So yeah, there are definitely some different approaches to this. And I think in the United States, you, you know, there's the Fredrickson uh, grading system here. Um, and when you look at the higher grade of the Fredericksons, um, those you're looking at, you know, six weeks of non-weight bearing or, or controlled weight bearing, I think for the lower grades. So like a grade one, which is just basically just some, you know, some you know, early bone marrow edema. I think what most people would consider to be like a stress reaction, th those mm -hmm. folks just, they, they only need a couple of weeks of, of controlled, um, yeah. loading and they might be able to get away with, if they can walk without pain. And, you know, I think that's not, I think that's totally fine. I think that's kind of what you want, but I think for the most part, if we're taking kind of your average person with a, with a, a post-remedial tibial bone stress injury, I and mean, I think we can, I think we'll, let's kind of talk about the middle of the bell shaped curve. I, I think you're looking at four to six weeks of controlled weight bearing. Um, I think you're looking at, um, you know, I think using bilateral crutches makes a lot of sense for the, for the th first three to four weeks. Um, then I think at that, then you can start weaning them off of those. Um, I, I like using crutches a lot because the gait doesn't seem to get um, altered um, a ton. And I, and I like, then you can, you can really use the crutches to kind of control that person's uh, the amount of weight that they're bearing through that limb. And, you know, the goal here is they really should not be experiencing any pain when they're loading it. So if they're experiencing pain with walking, then that's telling you that you need to offload them a little bit more. Um, and you yeah. should do periodic reassessments on that so that you're continuing to progress the amount of weight bearing they're having. You shouldn't just say, okay, so six weeks, no weight bearing whatsoever. The, the idea in those six weeks is that you, you slowly start seeing if you can increase the loading. And if you experience the patient experiences pain when they're walking with their crutches, um, you know, then that's a good sign. You need to get them to unweight that limb a little bit more. And that pain can occur during the actual loading when they're actually stepping or later on in the day. And this usually is what happens. We get some increase in bone marrow edema and that's like at pain at rest. So pain at night or pain upon waking the next day. Those are really good signs that the athlete needs to pay very close attention to that they need to reduce the amount of loading that they're doing. It's just the, you know, that bone is just not ready for that yet. So um, I, I think equally okay is to use a cam walker um, as, you, as you mentioned. And a cam walker, I mean, it has that, has that big cam. And what that cam does, it's like a rocker sold shoe. It reduces the moment arm on your, on your plantar flexor. So it reduces those plantar flexor forces uh, considerably. And also the rigid sole does as well. And so, um, you know, as long as it's a high, you know, higher boot, I think those are okay. I, I would say that we don't, we, you know, we end up, most athletes we end up seeing use, use, use crutches, um, mm -hmm. I would say. And, and, and for me, I think that that makes more sense because if you're walking in a boot, it's really going to change your, your overall gait dynamics it's going to change the way you're loading that bone. Um, and yeah. I think that might introduce some other issues down the road. Yeah. Okay. Kelly, did you have any questions regarding offloading? That was, that was awesome. I'm pumped up at the moment. This is such good knowledge. I'm excited. <laughs> oh. We, well, we got a little bit, um, I guess, kind of back on topic again from the, the rehab journey oh, yeah. that, that we were sort of going down with the tibial bone stress injury. So I guess once someone has started walking again and, and is maybe walking and going for brisk walks for a couple of weeks or one week, then how are you sort of planning their return to running program? Yeah. I and mean, I would say even like a little bit before that, what I would start saying is that around week four, I, I start, even if they're still in crutches on crutches and we start introducing some, uh, bilateral heel raises, mm -hmm. uh, so start getting them ready. Um, so just, you know, full weight bearing bilateral. So of course they've only got 50% of their weight through that limb. Uh, we have them do some, uh, you know, some, uh, some calf raises. So we start doing those then around week five, we, we try to start introducing, uh, so they some, be pain free. Yes, they need to. Yeah, they should be pain-free. 
Yeah. yeah if they're experiencing pain then with that, that's, that's too much load. Um, yeah, pain, you know, I really wish we had a better tool. Um, but that's the best tool we have right mm -hmm. now for determining, like, if this athlete is tolerating the load, it, it seems to work well, you know, that's what brought them into your office to begin with, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it seems to be, it seems to be okay. And of course, if, you know, if the athlete is, you know, does experience any pain, it, it's okay. Um, for me, I just say, okay, we just do, we're going to take three weeks or three to three weeks. We're going to take three days of, of reducing the overall load. And that seems to be enough to, for them to calm down. And then they, they really should be just fine. Um, after that. Sorry. And you were, yeah, so I was saying, so within that six weeks start to come out and do some heel raises and then they're progressing, say they got to the six week mark and I'm coming out of the boot or, or the crutches. What's it, it looking like for their return to running? Yeah. So we like to have them walk for, they need to be walking outside the boot for, uh, for three straight days without any, any exacerbation of pain. Uh, they should have, it should be pain-free. And then at that point we have them do, uh, 10 single leg hops. Uh, and if they can do 10 single, 10 single leg hops and they don't have pain during the hopping and they don't have pain the next day, then that's the time that we start doing a return to run program. Uh, we typically start off with having the athlete, walk more. Uh, we start getting their uh, overall walking up to 30 minutes uh, straight at a time. And ideally we'd like to get them up to 40 minutes. The reason why we want to do that is because um, if we um, if, if we just have this person who's been walking on crutches and we suddenly throw them back into a return to run program, uh, and the, let's say the average person is just getting, I don't know, let's say 6,000, 7,000 steps in a day, and they do a 30 minute walk run program, I mean, they're, they're going to almost essentially double the number of loading cycles that they're experiencing in a day. And so we, we really like to get them doing just a period of walking. It might just be just for a week um, before, before we start doing that. And it seems to make things go uh, quite a bit easier. So we really try to start doing that. And, and when, when they can fully weight bear, uh, we start progressively increasing the amount of walking time that they're doing with the idea being that we can, we can recommence running around week six. Yeah. Um, and again, you know, going back to the different grades that might be plus or minus, some of people might be a lot quicker than that. And some, some are going to be, um, a little bit, a little bit longer out for the more severe bone stress injuries. Um, yeah. you know, when there is definitely a, there seems to be a continuum when we're looking at the tibia as well, the post remedial tibia, it's not like this, this, you know, dichotomous thing. It's, you have a bone stress injury or you don't, there's, there really does seem to be this, 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 this overall continuum that's occurring. And does so, yeah, that look so, like walk running as well? Like say 30 seconds of, of walking, sorry, 30 seconds of running four and a half minutes of walking for four sets or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, we've, there are, you'll see, a, there are a lot of different programs that are out there. That's what we, we basically, I usually have them, you know, warm up for, for walking for five minutes. Then we start them doing like a minute, a minute on three minutes, mm -hmm. a minute of, of running, maybe even less than that, 30, 30 seconds of running, but typically a minute seems to be fine. And then have them do three minutes of walking. And then we'll repeat that um, five reps um, or six reps. And then we finished with some, just some, some walking, um, you know, at the, uh, yeah. the very end for me, uh, I tend to take the first two weeks pretty, they're pretty boring. I don't, I don't increase each session. Um, and the reason is, is that you're throwing a lot of new loads at the bone and you know, the bone hasn't experienced those loads in, in six to eight weeks. And so for the first two weeks, we try to go a little bit slow. It's not till week three, where we start really increasing the amount of volume that the person is doing. And, and, you know, doing that by week six, that, that has us, um, you know, up to running 30 to 40 minutes, uh, continuously. And at that point they're, they, they typically are well on their way to getting, uh, to getting back. Um, mm -hmm. what I just described is the fastest, I think you can do it. That's a pretty fast schedule. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're you know, you're talking 12 weeks uh, of, of, you know, back before they start kind of getting back to somewhat of early stage, like early training loads. So I really, I really think that that's the fastest you can go. Um, I think that when we look at what the athlete can do and what we can do, it's really hard to speed that process up. And what's really driving that is the initial grade of the injury. So if you're, um, you know, this is one of the questions that we get a lot uh, is like, hey, is there anything I can do to speed up the healing of this? And there doesn't really seem to be any like real proven way to do it, but there are lots of ways you can slow it down. Um, <laughs> and so, and that's what you really want to prevent that athlete from doing. And of course, the, the big one being is um, too much, too much weight bearing um, in the first um, four to six weeks. That's, that's the biggest thing that's going to slow them down. The other thing too, is that, and there's been some really great, um, activity monitoring or actigraph studies where they put wearable devices on, on athletes when they're recovering from a bone stress injury. 
And um, a lot of these athletes, they're not changing their overall activity level. So they're just taking the amount of volume that they were doing with running and they're replacing it with cross training. And that cross mm -hmm. training often can be very vigorous. And so it's important to keep the reins tight on your athlete, particularly for the athlete who you suspect um, is dealing with some red S issues, that that red S is still going on because the athlete will figure out a way um, often to continue to have a very high train line. So for me, I, I, I like runners to get a little bit out of shape um, when they're recovering okay. from this because it's the, not only is it time for your bone to heal, but it's also a really important time for you to get your physiology back in order. If there's uh, you know, an underlying physiological uh, contributor to this bone stress injury. Yeah. I, I often say that as well. I'll often um, say, you know, it's not a bad thing to, to lose a bit of fitness because when you do return to run, eventually it's going to be slow and it's going to be a lot less than what you're used to. So, you know, if you're super fit, then you'll just get frustrated. So I, I definitely say that too. I have another question on speaking about timeframes, which is something that I tend to, to struggle with a little bit myself with, with patients is setting um, realistic goals in regards to returning to, to races or competition. Um, it's, it's often tricky because I'm, I'm trying to sort of give them a, a really realistic time frame and it's frustrating for them because it's not as soon as they want to. Well, how do you um, best approach that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I mean, if they're in any sort of buildup for a big event, I think they need to um, reassess their goals. I think they need to probably find another event um, that's going to allow them to do that. I think, you know, you know, we're in the United States, um, college and high school, it's really built around like the the fall cross country season and then the spring uh, track season. I think if you get a bone stress injury at the beginning of one of those seasons, your your season's done i think you you need to just um which is really unfortunate um but yeah I, I think you really need to reassess and start targeting uh you know some spring races if you got your bone stress injury in the fall if you're leading up to a marathon i think it's the exact same thing i think that um you know you probably need to go back to a drawing board and figure out what's going to happen because as i mentioned earlier you have a 600 percent increased risk of having a subsequent one and so you need to be really smart and very deliberate don't don't think it's a um you know, this like rogue event, there usually is, is perhaps something else going on there that, that you need to uh, consider. So, yeah, I think that's a really, it's a really hard thing. I mean, um, there's, uh, runners have a tend to tend to have a perfectionist attitude, um, or view of things. And I think that, um, um, some, uh, Lace, uh, Lace Lewetke, who's in the United States, she's at, in Wisconsin. She's done a lot of work looking at perfectionism and athletes, as it relates to bone stress injuries and, and also medial tibial stress syndrome. And um, there seems to be a, a very positive relationship between the two, meaning that more uh, perfectionist tendencies that the athlete tends to demonstrate, the greater their risk of developing a, a some sort of bone stress injury that's going to occur there. And, and then because of that, um, those athletes, when they're coming out of this injury, they're also the same ones that, that tend to be very um, objectively driven when it comes to looking at running volume um, and are running time uh, in their training. And so they often will start ignoring um, some other like internal, I guess, uh, like how the running, how running is feeling and how fit they are and, and being realistic with themselves. Um, and they'll often, uh, this is, you know, the, the, one of the highest risk time periods for developing a bone stress injury is in the, mm -hmm. is in the six months after you've, or six months to a year after you've had one. And the big reason for that is because not only do we, um, not, not only are we recovering from bone stress injury in that specific site, but there's been some really great uh, research that has shown that we lose uh, bone density throughout our body because we've reduced the, the loading um, there. We're just not training at the same, with the same types of loads. Um, and so, so you've lost bone strength elsewhere. And mm -hmm. so that's another big reason why we tend to be at high risk for developing uh, some sort of, 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 of bone stress injury that's going to occur. And the ones I worry about the most are the ones that do a lot of non-weight bearing cross training in the early stages. So swimming, stationary biking, um, those sounds, and I think a lot of people do those. And I think a lot of clinicians prescribe those, but something to think about is that when, um, when astronauts are training to go into space, they do a lot of their training in a swimming pool. Um, and the reason why they do that is because it's a weightless environment. And we all know that when someone is returning from 
from uh, from space that they've lost a lot of bone health. And so that's that's a very poor modality for these individuals because you're basically putting someone probably who's got some compromised bone properties uh, in a position where it's just going to accelerate that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we mentioned earlier on when we were talking uh, athletes who train year round, and I know that um, Stuart Warden often recommends the a skeletal reset week after every sort of 12 weeks or so. Mm -hmm. Can we can we talk to that as well, Rich? Yeah, I think that when you look at uh, and and you know and Stu's done a lot of really awesome research in this area. Mitch Rao has also done a lot of work uh, in this area as well. He's looked at sports specialization, so we know that sports specialization is a major risk factor for for bone stress injuries in adolescents and also early twenty year olds. Um, and you know the big reason for that. So I so let's take it back and step back. When I say the highly specialized runner, I'm I'm talking about the run, the high school runner who's running nine months a year or more. They're not doing other sports. Um, those athletes, because of that, they tend to be a little higher risk for, for red S. But one of the other big reasons too, is that not only does not only do our bones become a little bit less responsive to, to loading repetitions within a cycle, like when it, like within a, like an actual like training bout, it also will occur over time too. So across the season. So as the season progresses, uh, you're going to still be accumulating bone micro damage, but the bone is going to get a little bit less good at, at responding and laying down new bone. And so once you get to the end of 12, 16 weeks, um, you're still accumulating some bone micro damage, but um, the bone is not laying down new, new bone mass. So there is this idea of we should do, you know, a week uh, or two weeks or maybe even three weeks of deloading and then start loading again. There's probably a better way. There, so that would be one way to do it. The other way to do it is that every third week, we should have a period of time when we're reducing our overall running volume and we're also reducing the overall magnitude of the loading. So we should probably lay off of our speed work every third or fourth week. That's going to provide like kind of like a mini reset. And that's going to allow us to kind of stretch out that those 12 weeks out to 16 weeks and perhaps a little bit longer, but yeah, we should definitely have a period of deloading and that's going to kind of resensitize the bone. Um, and so like when I'm working with like high school athletes, you know, a good thing to do is like fall cross country season, um, take a little bit of a break, go into basketball, you know, or just like ski in the winter here, uh, would be a great thing to do where you are doing some deloading, um, you know, and maybe in the spring do mountain biking or something like that. That would be, that would be a great way to do it. Um, and then mm -hmm. you're, you're still getting the mountain biking is going to provide a lot of the you know, the impact type forces are going to be helpful for, for building bone health. Uh, and at the same time, maybe do some running uh, at the same time, but you, that having that, that winter period where you're doing like a, you know, maybe even a couple months of deloading is going to be really healthy for the, for the athletes um, skeleton. That doesn't seem to be the case is strong. Once we reach skeletal maturity, I think you don't have to, because we're not, we're, you know, like when you're an adolescent, you're asking a lot of adolescent skeleton, you're asking them to basically accommodate to the training loads that are being thrown at them, but also get stronger. The bone's supposed to be getting stronger at this time period. Once we've reached our mid twenties, you know, it, it's probably not as important, but you still need to be really careful in the middle of the season, not to suddenly say, you know, like you, I don't know, you're on Instagram or something like that. And you suddenly see that doing plyometrics will really help your running, your running performance. And halfway through the season, you start throwing this, this big plyometric program at, at your bones. Um, your muscles are going to respond to that, but the bones are not. And, and in fact, that's a really great way to get, to get, to get a bone stress injury in the middle of the season is to suddenly throw some new, unique, high magnitude load at a time when the bone is not going to respond to it. So you need to be really careful about that as well. What's your opinion on, on bone simulators and shockwave? And I know there's one paper I'm thinking of that, that has shown like a really low frequency shockwave can have a little bit of an effect as similar to a bone simulator. What, are, what do you think of those two treatments, like as in isolation shockwave and, um, and a bone simulator? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know a lot about, about shockwave therapy. I know that... Um, Adam Tenaforte, who's a sports medicine physician at Harvard, he's a big advocate of using them, particularly for MTSS. I think mm -hmm. he has got, I think he's got some good uh, clinical success uh, from an anecdotal standpoint using them. Uh, I don't think anybody's done any sort of like any, any sort of trials with them. I know that the other one would be like low intensity pulse ultrasound. Um, and so you'll see, you know, it's also the acronym is LIPUS. Um, you'll see the use of LIPUS um, 
is has been done it seems like it there's some promise and like some lower uh lower level evidence papers but it doesn't seem to like really hold up with the higher evidence mm -hmm. um, papers it, it, so lipa seems to make the most sense for someone who has had a, like a delayed union mm -hmm. um you know bone stress injury um i, I think those people are going to be are going to be the folks that are going to make make the most sense for that we don't we don't do that we don't we don't use either either of those modalities but there does seem to be some promise there but you know it's funny the lipus literature has been around for a long time people have been talking about this since the early 2000s um i know like i, I had a delayed union uh clavicle fracture in 2005, and I used a lipus device. My my surgeon um, yeah. ended up having surgery on that. I used a lipus device then. So um, it's kind of like, well, I don't know. It's this modality's <laughs> had 15 plus 20 years to get some evidence behind it, and it, and it still doesn't seem to be there. That makes me think that it it it, it doesn't hurt, um, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to make this huge difference. I yeah. think if you are going to use it, the way to do it would be very much like these very micro sessions of, of bone loading where you do them for 10 minutes, you use the lipus device for 10 minutes, three times a day. So you allow the bone to recover in the four hours in between each one of those sessions. And I think that's probably going to be the best way to do it rather than doing like a 30 minute or a 45 minute session one time a day. I, I don't, I think you're not going to get anything out of once you get past the first five or 10 minutes of using that device. Yeah, I wanted to ask, and I know you've got running short for time. I didn't want to take up too much of your time. I did want to ask you around when you are returning to running, like post, you know, you come out of the boot or the crutches and you are doing your, your walk run intervals. In combination with that, what would you recommend? A couple of questions, like the frequency of running with the week and then the frequency of, of strength training within the week as well and how that would look. And if you were returning and let's say you build up to three minutes of, of running and two minutes of walking and you were to experience some pain in your shin, is it a rest for a week or a couple of days off and start again? Or, or how do you kind of um, address that? Yeah, we, you know, for me, I just do three days. Uh, yeah. I, I, three days of deloading seems to be adequate. It allows that um, mechanical irritation and biochemical irritation to go down. And then mm -hmm. just, then you need to go back one to two steps in your, in your progression. That's your bones way of saying, Hey, you overcooked it. Yeah. You, you got to back off a little bit and, 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 and see how it goes. Um, I think as far as frequency goes, um, three to four times a week is plenty of running, um, balanced with some cross training. We do our weight training on the same days as the run sessions and the return to run process so that the bone can really re recover very well on the off days. And that's the same way we manage our tendinopathy patients mm. as well. Mm. Yeah, great. All right, mate, thank, thank you so much for, for coming on. Is there, I know people, and I've mentioned it before, people can find you through Montana Running Lab, but is there anywhere else they can find you? Have you got anything coming up or that uh, clinicians can look out for? Yeah, as I mentioned uh, before we jumped on this, I started recording, I'm going to be in Melbourne. Uh, it looks like in um, in April. Um, so we're going to do a running symposium. So I'm looking forward uh, to doing that. My, we, I have a couple of online uh, education offerings we're going to start offering pretty soon. Um, and so I'm hoping to roll those out. We'll, we'll announce those on our Instagram site, but we'll have a, like a master class on bone health um, and also a master class on like lower limb. Uh, relative overuse injuries as well. Yeah, that sounds That's awesome. Sign us, sign us up for that. Yeah, we're just saying yeah, our fire would be awesome. Keep you come down. Did you <laughs> oh, say it's in, in Melbourne? You'll be coming too. Did you say Melbourne? Yeah, it's going to be in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to be at uh, at Latrobe University. So yeah, right. um, that's what I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that. Yeah, yeah, that'll be awesome. And yeah, Montana Running Lab over on the Instagram. But mm -hmm. hey, thank you that's so much, one, for coming on the podcast, but also for the incredible work that you put out. I know that you've helped both Kelly and I a lot clinically, and I can only imagine the other clinicians throughout the world, you know, some of your infographs and research as well um, that has helped people and patients. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Well, that that, that means a lot. That's the whole reason why I do it. So um, mm -hmm. thanks thanks for that. I really appreciate it. I'm glad that it's, it's helping yeah. some. It, it certainly is a lot of fun, and I, I learn a lot doing it as well, too. So. Thanks. Helping yeah. us and all of our patients. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you Love. so much. Lovely. See you later, Rich. All right. Thank you. Bye.